And it strikes me how strangely the uh, business world has already um, applied some of the techniques uh, in order to communicate better to uh, what they call the consumers, of course, um, maybe in a denigrating term. Um, because I think they have understood that by trial and error, because I know that we don't use the knowledge that is in this room, for instance, in order to arrive at our techniques. And I mean, I find that strange because that knowledge is there. Uh, but I think it's interesting to see how the business world has adapted to that and actually instinctively found the solutions. And uh, one of my uh, thoughts, of course, is that the commercial world has enormous resources in order to uh, go through a trial and error process. They don't need necessarily the knowledge. They probably reach these uh, techniques uh, with a lot of wastage because they didn't actually base it on, on existing science. Because much of the science that I hear here today and, and that I've read uh, in the last few years it is actually, you know, 20 years old, or at least it's the process started to accelerate very steeply uh, 20 years ago. I'm thinking of neuroscience and psychology in this case. Um, but I'll, I'll look at a, a couple of points that were meant to go into my presentation tomorrow. That is, basically, even on an evolutionary basis, humans have always been looking for strategies in order to simplify information. Uh, simplify, is it information or knowledge now? <laughs> the question was raised this morning, but anyway. Simplify information and knowledge, or both or one of them. Uh, in order to act more efficiently, quickly, uh, and often in life you need to take decisions much quicker than you would afford to be able to do by engaging in system two thinking and analytical thinking and synthetic and systemic thinking, integral and organic thinking. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about some of those strategies tomorrow. Um, because they are very interesting. Um, and I will give a few examples of which I think are interesting because they are easily understood. They are not very scientific. They are real life reactions. We talked about uh, Steve Jobs, why Steve Jobs became famous and Steve Wozniak, we know, hardly know what he did after helping Steve Jobs to invent Apple. And that was it is Steve Jobs' understanding of how people react to products. And, and one of the, and I'm sure I'm not teaching anything here, but I mean, the, the whole spirit of Apple is they didn't go out and make a market research and find out what people wanted. They told people what they wanted. And, and there is whole, this whole theory about Apple's uh, marketing approach, which is don't tell people what you do. Tell people who you are. People are interested in what you are. Then they will buy from you, magically. I mean, not magically. There is a, a very clever reasoning behind that. Uh, I recently re read this book, Inside Jokes, Using Humor to Reverse Engineer the Mind, by Hurley, Dennett, and Adams. And that bo book was fascinating in many ways. Uh, we'll touch upon some of them tomorrow. But the theory is that emotions are not a set of important subsystems sitting alongside the cognitive subsystems. In the, brains, in the brain, emotions rule. We mean this literally. That's the authors saying that. So emotions are the fuel, I'm again um, quoting them, are the fuel that gives rise to social behavior, but also to different levels of intelligence. Modern theories of emotions also conclude that the purpose is to motivate. And this is something that I think if you look at what some operators in the commercial world has been able, have been able to do, they've understood this. 
maybe just by trial and error. But I think it's very interesting now to try and bring those two things together and see how they arrived there. Probably lots of money and lots of errors. And here we are trying to take it from the bottom up, reasoning through applying analytical thinking. Or it may be holistic thinking, actually. Because I think that that can give us some clues to how to, to the, what the object of this course is, and that is to develop the deep thinking side of things and the holistic thinking. Um, I'm not going to talk about holistic thinking, I'm talking about what people actually do in order to see, okay, how do you avoid that? When we discuss, I call it high level of thinking, which is my sort of summary of what this course is about. Is there something to learn from the psychological factors that affect the way that the public at large processes information? We're obviously not talking about the public at large here. We're talking about the deep thinkers. But can we learn something from the way that normal people in the street uh, are? I think we can. Second question. How might these insights be utilized to further the advancement of knowledge today? Third question, what are the ethical, this one is quite long, so I'll take it in, in phases. What are the ethical implications of an ever-increasing understanding of the disproportional importance of subconscious thought and therefore of subconscious communication, which is what the commercial world has understood very well and is using all the time? But obviously it has ethical implications. And the last question, is scientific training sufficient to immunize scientists against these, I call them mental ambushes, this tendency to try to find shortcuts to arrive at a decision rather than doing the long, going the long way? Thank you.